Welcome to the midweek edition of Business Morning on Channel Salvation. We promise to make the next 55 minutes of your time an informative and advantageous one. I'm Imi John Mekwa. Well, let's start from the global oil space where prices climbed today, extending big gains in the previous session after the United States Federal Reserve chief signaled the central bank may raise rates more slowly than expected, which should support oil demand in the near term. U.S. West Texas Intermediate Crude Futures rose 38 cents to $81.60 a barrel, adding to 3.8% jump in the previous session. Brent's Crude Futures gained 22 cents to $83.94 a barrel after jumping 3.5% in the previous session. Data from the American Petroleum Industry, Institute industry gave a weaker picture on fuel demand, with a smaller decline in crude stockpiles than expected and bigger bills than expected in gasoline and distillate inventories. Gasoline stockpiles rose by 10.9 million barrels compared with analysts' expectation for a 2.4 million barrels build. Distillate inventories, which include diesel and heating oil, rose by 3 million barrels compared with forecasts for a 1.8 million barrel increase. However, buoying the market was the U.S. Energy Information Administration's upgraded oil demand outlook released yesterday seeing total U.S. demand rising by 840,000 barrels per day in this year, 2022, from last year. And that's up a previous forecast uh, increase of 700,000 barrels per day. At the same time, the EIA paired its production outlook for 2022, expecting U.S. oil output to rise by 640,000 barrels per day. And that's down from an earlier forecast for an increase of 670,000 barrels per day. The World Bank says it's expecting Nigeria's economy to grow by 2.5% this year, which is 0.1% higher than 2.4% uh, estimated growth projection in 2021. According to its latest Global Economic Prospects report, the World Bank attributes the higher growth projection to higher oil prices and the gradual easing of OPEC plus production cuts, which is expected to benefit the country. Meanwhile, the World Bank says it expects growth across the sub-Saharan Africa to firm slightly to 3.6% this year and 3.8% next year, that's 2023, with elevated commodity prices expected to support near-term recovery for the region. And still talking about forecasts, the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry says it expects Nigeria's economy to grow between 2.5 and 4 percent this year, despite concerns over the expected impact of fuel subsidy removal and supply chain disruptions. At a forum in the State of the Economy held in Lagos, the president of LCCI, Dr. Michael Alawali Ko, asked the government to intensify its efforts in tackling the challenge of insecurity across the country in order to sustain the country's path to recovery. We are expecting that uh, world economies will do much better this year, uh, looking at the impact of COVID on economies worldwide last year and the year before. So if, as a country, we are thinking about two, about three, 3.5 percent last year then we are very hopeful that we should do better this year than we did last year if cbn was projecting five percent that is not far away from what we are saying but we are in fact of the opinion that if all things go well if we can resolve or try to improve on our insecurity uh, take it away from us totally or make it very, very minimal, then give us a better country for security. We can even do 6 7%. Well, talking about how to meet up with that projection and uh, that of the World Bank and other projections, uh, the government certainly has many roles to play. One of it is programs that will aid economic growth. And so the Export Expansion Facility Program, uh, a one-year scheme launched by the Nigerian Export Promotion Council, is one of those. It was launched in January 2021, and they say they have disbursed direct grants to non-oil exporters under the federal government's 2.3 trillion naira economic sustainability plan, the NESP. 
as the program uh, gets close to its end, so yeah, you know, since it started, uh, except extended or, 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 or the otherwise, we have one of the beneficiaries, Mr. Andrew Kaude. He's the Chief Executive Officer, Export and Sell. He's a uh, beneficiary of the 2021 Export Expansion Program. And he talks to us uh, as the program winds down now, some of the impacts on his business and uh, where he thinks can be improved on in case the government decides to extend it. Good to have you on the show, Mr. O'Day. Good morning. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, tell us, uh, they said they've, uh, this boss, I think, about 5 billion naira or 50 billion naira. 50 billion. 50 yes. billion naira yes. within January 2021 to, you know, Yes. 2022 now, mm -hmm. uh, and you are one of the beneficiaries. Sure. Tell us how this has affected you. How much of the 50 billion did you get? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'll say it has been a great help to us. You know, um, the the facility was one that came as a shock to me. You know, and the openness in which uh, it was disbursed was also amazing. Um, you know, I just got a call from somebody, uh, the NEPC, one of the directors, and they said, you know, we've seen what you are doing, export and sell, that we have been training businesses and showing them how to export, that there's a facility available out there uh, for us to tap into. And we applied within two weeks. We got a call from the uh, coordinator of the program, uh, a lady by the name of Morin. And that was it, you know. Now, the grant we got has been amazing because one, it has enabled us to scale our training. Where we were training about a thousand Nigerian businesses on how to export, this year we are looking at training over 10,000 businesses and that has been made possible through that grant. So uh, part of the conditions they gave us was that we need to be able to take it, you know, with where the world is going to take that program from being a physical training into a virtual one so that people, Nigerians, businesses from everywhere can log on, train, you know, and that is some of the things we're doing. They also enabled us to set up the first uh, Amazon export warehouse, you know, because what we do basically is we help Nigerian businesses to put their products to sell on Amazon. And, um, you know, so the grant helped in that regard, not only we have also been able to set up a dedicated training facility in VI. So instead of us traveling, you know, renting facilities, paying one million to rent a facility to train businesses, we now have, through this grant, a facility uh, in the heart of Nigeria, in the heart of uh, the, the, the business center of this country, uh, where we are able to train all sorts of businesses, uh, you know. So, so it's it's been an amazing scheme. Um, I think. When my, did you join in? When did you start? Well, um, I think we applied sometime in July. Um, we got the funding uh, sometime in August. You know, so from August till now, um, you know, we've been able to achieve all these things. Uh, and there's still a lot more to do, you know. Because okay, so when you say that you got a call, I mean, yes. because uh, truth be told, uh, yes. a lot of Nigerians do not trust programs that come from the government. I so. don't trust it either <laughs> until this. Yeah, so somebody would expect, you mentioned Maureen, maybe yes. you're related to her yeah. or, you know. So how, I mean, did you just stay on your own and they stumbled on your data and reached out to you? Yes. You know, and, and so, all that. So, uh, you know, over the years, we've been working with the NEPC. So I got to know one of their directors, uh, Mr. Faleke. He's, um, you know, one of those that is very passionate about export. Uh, and uh, he knows what we do. He came to some of our events. You know, we hold events all over the country, training businesses on how to export sell in the USA and how to get their products, how to find them buyers all over the, uh, the US. And he came to one of our training and that was just it. He was impressed with what we were doing. He gave me a call, said, apply for this. I went there, I never, I have not known Maureen in any way. Uh, and that's how we got it. And surprisingly, when they gave us the first batch, um, when we opened the Amazon Export Warehouse, the former ED of the NEPC, Shegu, uh, Mr. Shegu Awolowo, came to commission it. And when he saw what we had done within a very short period, he approved for us to get the second batch. And it is that second batch we have now used to set up the training facility uh, in VI 
that we are now using to train medium and large businesses on how to help. So is, is this grant all about training? No. So um, one of the things you see when you're talking about export is that a lot of Nigerian businesses do not know the right process to export. And that's why you have agencies like NAVDAC complaining that you know they keep getting reports that Nigerian products are being rejected, rejected outside. Yes. So the training, let me give an example. When we started our program, uh, helping people uh, sell products on Amazon, we had people who were sending things that, were, that could not be listed. You know, so you have people who will send copyrighted items, you know, have people who send Mickey Mouse uh, bed sheet and pillowcase, and you can't list that on Amazon because those are uh, trademark uh, infringement. So we saw that training was a huge component. A lot of Nigerian businesses don't know the licenses they need to sell in the US, to sell in Europe. So that training became a key. We, we had to put a hold on the whole process and until we train you, show you the ways that things ought to be done before you can come on board uh, the platform. So it's not just about training. They have other facilities. They've been able to do um, uh, export uh, warehousing in various countries and so many things. I know they have done a lot. But for us, we are not just about training. We are about uh, showing you the way, taking your products there, finding buyers for you, expanding the market for businesses to uh, sell in the U.S. And that's so, what it is. So uh, do the coordinators of the program, the organizers of the export uh, ex extension program, do they do a follow-up? Do they work oh, yes. with you? Oh, or yes. Do, oh, you yes. Know? So we have... It's a grant, so you're not paying back. Yes, we are not. But before they give you the grant, you sign an agreement with them that says, this, this, this is what you're going to use it for. So when we did the first draw, before they gave us the second draw, they actually verified that we had used the first draw to do what we were supposed to use it for. We had set up the warehouse. We had uh, you know, bought computers. We, we've trained staffs and all those things. So it's not just like free money. Even though you don't pay back, you still have to show that you use that money judiciously. Are there and, consequences? Uh, th there is, because it's stated there in the contract. You know? But again, you, you, know, you bring up a very good point, and that is you know, when uh, I heard that they are winding down the program, I was like, you know, you don't, I, I think that's a wrong move by government. You don't throw 50 billion at people, and then you wind down the program, and the program does not have a way to monitor the utilization of those funds after it's wound down. I think this should be a program that is annually on the budget of the NEPC or whoever it is. Because you know, take us for example, you know, from the, the return on investment calculation I've done on this, you know, for every dollar that they gave us, we are gonna bring in over a thousand dollars in export because now Companies that were dormant, that didn't know how to go about export, how to find buyers, are now able to. You know, so I don't think it's a scheme that should be wound down. It should actually be a scheme that should be extended so that when they give you funds, they are able to come in and see that you actually utilize the funds. You know, we don't want people buying cars uh, out of such funds, when it's supposed to be used uh, to grow the country's non-oil export. Okay, I, I think you touched a, a little bit on this, uh, because yes. uh, earlier this week we had a discussion on, you know, the non-oil export. The, sure. In fact, the Shippers Association complained that they claim that over 80% of our exported goods are rejected, yes. agro oh, exported yes. goods, mm -hmm. because of issue of packaging, of yes. quality, you know, even from the... Uh, Pre-harvest, yes. you know, post-harvest, and, yes. and and all that. So, uh, is the program doing anything in it about it? Well, um, when we talk about the rejection of goods uh, abroad, um, again, that's where that training component comes in. You know, you people need to know how to package goods before they send them out. And again, this is where um, I think the, the activities of some of the agencies that are supposed to uh, help export needs to be improved upon. So let me give an example. Um, NAVDAC, for example, 
NAVDAC is responsible for uh, food, food and drugs, cosmetics, all those things to be exported. If you have a simpler process, working with NAVDAC to get your products exported, a lot of people will not go through the back door to sneak products outside of the country. And that is what is causing a lot of this. And it's not just NAVDAC. You talk about SON, Standard Organizations of Nigeria. Are the processes to know if your product is export ready so easy? Mm -hmm. Those are some of the challenges why people prefer to just pack anything they see and give it to uh, some of these uh, exporters. You know? So the training still is a vital component of export. If people don't know the right way to package, there is no way they are going to do it the right yeah, way. Yeah, but before the packaging, you know, they also talk about farmers. Yes. You know, the, the farming process, the process of getting the crops out, yes. of sunning the crops, mm -hmm. you know, and, and things like that. Yes. You know, so I, I don't think that has any... It, it depends on what you are shipping, really. If you are shipping processed foods, then you have to go through the process of making sure it's well packaged. But if you are shipping on processed foods, then that doesn't really come in. You know, because there are certain buyers who will buy the processed, buy the unprocessed. You know, so I don't think that is an aspect of the farmers. I still think our agencies, you know, because again, we are talking about NEPC and the EEFP. NEPC is not the only person who has a key role for export. In fact, they have a very limited role when you talk about export. Their key role is training and facilitation, and I think they are doing an excellent job. But when it comes to the other agencies that are supposed to help, that is where we have a big problem. And until these agencies are made more efficient, we will continue to just talk about export without realizing the benefit. So from your perspective, uh, agencies such as NAFDAQ, such as SON, SON, SON even the customs, even the customs, customs, because even. a lot of exporters uh, yes. talk about the bureaucracy and, the, and, and yeah, the regulators they have to go through. Yes. You know? And then, of course, you also have activities around the ports. Yes. We still have a lot of manual processing <sighs> around the port. I spoke to an exporter <laughs> some time ago, and he told me how that, uh, I think, he had cashew. Yes. And before he could export, it, it started having a... Let me give you an example. The biggest um, African food uh, market seller in the U.S., um, uh, one Mr. Philip Odushot, is a Nigerian. Uh, he wanted to export yams to the USA, right? Uh, he, the, the container got to the port. It spent close to three to four weeks before he could get clearance to export it. And the yam now, what is happened? In... The yam started spoiling. By the time it got to the U.S., a lot of it had spoiled. Now, when you bring in things into the U.S. and they see rotten things, you know what they do? They have to burn that whole container. And you, the, uh, the exporter, will have yeah, to pay for the burning. And you even be blacklisted. He had to pay close to $5,000 to, uh, to, to, to do that. You know what he did? He went to set up a facility in Ghana. So now, a Nigerian is now feeding the Ghanaian economy because of the inefficiencies you have with some of these agencies. That is what is killing us. Take, take the US, for example. 70% of the foods, the processed foods you see on the shelves of African stores are coming from places like Ghana. Sure. Yet, about 80% of the buyers are Nigerians. So what are we doing? You know, we really, look, it's, it's the presidency or whoever needs to come and have a way to monitor all these agencies so that they work together. Are the, are the there is no too coordination. Much? Are you it, saying, it are you saying there's no coordination or there are too much? Look, you see, our, let's, you know, I, I'm passionate about uh, food and cosmetics because there is a lot to do there. You know, from my own calculation, we as a country, we are losing about $500 million monthly due to the inefficiencies of some of these agencies. Now, you don't really blame some of them. Let me give you an example. When I noticed some of these issues, I had a meeting with the DG of NAVDAQ. And we discussed some of these things. And you discover that to a large extent, some of the issues they face may not really be their problem. The, if you look at the law, the, the enabling law that formed NAVDAQ, some of the requirements in that act is not friendly to export. So for example, 
you have products that you are supposed to export to the international market. These products, the regulation, the act that forms that, that does not allow you to list some of the benefits of that product. So you have a product from Ghana, a shea butter, for example, saying it removes blemishes and all those things. But that from Nigeria, because of the enabling law, does not allow you to state that. Which product do you think the vast majority of foreigners <laughs> are going to take? So Obviously. we need to take a deep look into all of these the things. The laws that empower these agents. So it's not Some just of them about are the operations a of the Okay. They need to, to be re-looked at. You know, there's a lot going on, you know. A that, lot is going on, yeah. obviously. And uh, unfortunately, Nigeria is losing a whole lot. We are losing So when we talk about millions. diversifying the economy, these are some of the factors that actually truncate the efforts of the government yeah, exactly. that we see, you exactly. know, up here. Thank mm. you so much, uh, Ms. Andu Kaude, Chief Executive Officer of Export and Sell and Beneficiary of the Export Expansion Program for 2021. Thank you so much. We do wish you the best and we appreciate your passion and we hope we will see it materialize into I, some I pray so. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Yes. So we'll take a break now. After the break, Apex Commodity Market is next. Do stay with us. It's Business Morning on Channels Television. Yeah, welcome back. It's Apex time now. And for the week ended the 10th of January 2022, FX Commodity Exchange recorded an impressive increase in the volume traded, going from about 1 million to over 7.5 million. That's a whole lot. Well, we have Femi Kende, analyst, structuring and origination at Apex with the details. Hello, Femi. Good morning. What's the details? Let's have the full picture of all of this. Hi, Chimese. Good morning. So activities on the exchange significantly increased compared to the previously reported week in terms of the turnover, the volume traded, and the number of these executed. For the turnover, um, about 7, million, um, 7 billion um, naira worth of contracts were executed this week, which represented a, a six, over a 600 percentage increase week on week. Um, also, for the volume traded, about 7 million contracts were traded this week, which uh, represented over 700 um, percentage um, increase week on week. And for the number of deals, uh, the, the week actually saw the execution of 500, eight, 500 and 595 deals, representing a over 200 over a 200 percentage increase week on week. Um, in terms of the financial benchmarks on the exchange, we actually saw. Uh, the AFS Commodities Index declining marginally by 1.12 percentage um, to close the week at 455 index points. Um, for the volume traded across um, all commodities for the week, we the exchange actually saw the trade of maize, soybean, paddy rice, cocoa, sorghum, and cashew. Um, however, maize accounted for a significant bulk of the trade for this week. Um, Sogom had a beautiful week as um, the commodity, the trade of the commodities in currently such compared to what was traded in the previously reported week. Um, in terms of commodities prices, uh, the, the staple market and the export market um, experienced um, a significant surge in the level um, in the closing price on the exchange. For maize, uh, maize closed the week at 234 naira per contract, which represented a 6.43 percentage increase week on week. For paddy, paddy closed the week at 217 naira per contract, which represented a 7.02 percentage increase week on week. For cocoa, cocoa um, increased, um, surged by 12.8% to close the week at 1,296 naira per contract. And for cashew, um, cashew closed the week at 456 naira per contract, to, um, representing a 0.47 percentage increase week on week. However, um, there, was, there was a slight decline in the, um, in the prices of soybean and sorghum for the reported week, as soybean actually closed the week with, at 330. 90 naira per contract, which represented a 0.95 increase week on week, and Sogom closed the week at 214 naira per contract, which represented a 20.47 percentage decline week on week. Um, for more information about our report, you could actually check our website, which is www.afexnigeria.com, or you could follow us on our social media handle at afexnigeria.com or comex by afex. All right, uh, Femi. Well, given the performance of the commodities since uh, 2022 started, what would you say are the inherent benefits uh, playing in the market? So, um, 
over time, we've actually observed that the commodities market is actually primed to provide diverse benefits to different stakeholders with uh, numerous objectives in the market. Um, um, key ones, or the key ones to mention in this case, would be uh, the hedge against uh, inflation, the hedge against um, exchange rate devaluation, um, and the possibility of actually having superior return over time. And this is as relating to the capital market players, because at the end of the day, these players or these guys will want to prevent the erosion of their capital. And we know that inflation in the country has not been quite favorable since the start of the pandemic. So when you, over time, empirical evidence has actually suggested that, um, um, empirical evidence has actually suggested that inflation has returned below um, the, uh, what the ACI, the AFS Commodity Index, has returned over time. Um, a four-year average would actually show that the ACI has returned over t um, 28 percentage, while the um, four-year average of the inflation actually shows a 14 percent um, increase. So if you look at this, you know that if I'm putting my money in the commodities market at the end of the day, or if I'm if I'm trying if I want to hedge against the loss of capital, it is advisable for me to invest in domestic staples because these the fundamentals backing the prices of these commodities in the country are actually pushing to an upward trend continuously. And uh, currently on the exchange, what products offerings uh, do you think will benefit different stakeholders? Right. So. Um, we, we, you actually want to look at this from a processor standpoint and from a capital market standpoint, right? Uh, if you look at the fundamentals back in the commodities market, we know that supply um, continues to outweigh demand, right? Which is one of the reasons why at Apex we we, we developed pro or we developed the asset back commercial paper to honestly help. Uh, processors hedge against um, a, dis uh, a disruption in commodities supply and also help them um, help them to actually continue operation um, into perpetuity or for the fiscal here. So that's one actually one of the benefits that we, we envisage um, is quite useful to processors in the market. In terms of um, products that might be useful to capital market players, we look at our, our FETC, that is the Fair Trade Exchange Traded Commodity. Now, capital market players are usually adverse towards playing in this space because of numerous reasons. Number one might be information asymmetry um, and other reasons. Right, but with the FETC, we've provided a transparent means and a very cheap means for people to actually plug into or plug their funds or employ their funds into the commodity space and watch it actually return superior return at the end of the day. So, with this in mind, we believe that uh, at Apex, we will continue with we we are providing innovative products to actually help different stakeholders in the market create shared prosperity. All right, Femi, thank you so much. I will take the conversation further now, still with Apex. For many smallholder farmers, one of the most challenging barriers they confront is getting their products to the market. Markets in developing countries frequently lack integration, as evidenced by a lack of communication and information sharing. As a result, while markets in one region may offer higher prices for commodity, farmers in other regions have no way of learning about or capitalizing on these price differentials. One of the preferred solutions to this is commodity exchange, and that's where Apex comes into the picture. We have Yusuf Ogumbi, the head structuring and origination at Apex, to tell us how they are filling in this gap. Good to speak for you, uh, Mr. Ogumbi. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to be here again. So how do you think that uh, the commodity exchange can play a role in price standardization of commodities, ensuring smallholder farmers get value for their produce? Yeah, um, like you said, one key problem we've seen in this space is the problem of um, information asymmetry, where a number of people have a, an idea of what prices are, while it, some others don't have that that information at hand. So that means that a lot of arbitrage can then happen in, on this just by having that information. And if you look at what technology has allowed us to achieve given recent advancements, it's just basic for us to be able to say uh, there's information on prices across board and everybody's able to see um, what these prices are. This is one of the key um, parameters the exchange focuses on. And if you look at it, it allows everybody to have a sense of what prices are across board. And that reduces that arbitrage information, uh, the arbitrage you can get on um, um, the information that you have in any location. So exchanges provide this form function and help solve this, um, the problem of information asymmetry. Uh, with the solutions of storage facilities and funds to mop up crops from commodity exchange like FX, is Nigeria likely to close the food production gaps anytime soon? 
hopefully that that that's that a stretch honestly and i think um g looking at a, ten, a period of 20, 15 to 20 years, looking at some of the advancements we have, some of the solutions we have on the exchange, I think it will be, it will, it, we, will, we might be able to, to solve this problem. Um, some of the solutions concerning capital, pro provision of capital, provision of storage, provision of input. Uh, the, the problem of food security is a, is a long-term problem that you would address um, with a long-term mindset. And we are here for the long-term goal. And I think if you look at some of the solutions that we have outlined, um, they, they help us achieve this goal long term. So for us, we think that this solution, this, this, this problem can be solved in a period of, say, 10, 10 15 years, um, given the kind of challenges we have in the country. Uh, we also hope that a number of other, other um, solutions will come from other stakeholders that, that are needed in the, in the entire ecosystem that commodities exchange can play a significant role in the AFCFTA and put Africa in a vantage position to maximize the benefits of uh, that agreement. Come can I hear you? Do you think that the commodity exchange can put Africa at an advantage to maximize the AFCFTA agreement? Yeah, pretty much. If you look at other, other continents where you have similar structures, um, if you look at the European Union, for instance, you have markets that allow everybody to be integrated. Um, you have these kind of solutions that allow everybody to access markets, sell whatever they have. And the power of market integration is, 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 is very important. If you are able to provide that market integration um, solution to people across board, um, say, for instance, you are able, you wanted to buy coffee from Nigeria, you are able to buy the coffee on an exchange, deliverable against Kenya. These kind of solutions are very important in integrating these countries together. And if we look at it from an African standpoint, where you have a number of countries that are significant in each of these regions, so you have a Kenya in East Africa, you have a Nigeria in West Africa, these kind of integrations on a, on a commodity exchange level, where you are able to transact on that market and execute your transactions seamlessly and efficiently, can help to fast track um, this, um, the, 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 the benefits AFCFTA provides to Africa. And uh, seeing that AFEX is expanding to other African countries, how are you maximizing mm -hmm. the benefits of AFCFTA in your expansion uh, plan? So for any country with a, for any company with a Pan-African view, with a Pan-African objective moving into the future, AFCFTA is a fantastic opportunity for everybody. And if you look at it with Nigeria, with effects in Nigeria, effects in Kenya, effects in other African countries, you would be able to leverage on some of the benefits AFCFTA provides. If you look at the African market, there's a strong emphasis as it stands on the regional markets where you have countries within regions trading mostly amongst themselves, but AFCFTA now brings it up to the African level. And with us spreading our wings, expanding to other African countries, I think the AFCFTA benefits provides us the leverage to move into these countries. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, all stakeholders that participate primarily on the, uh, on the commodities exchange now have a wider array of opportunities to execute their contracts. So looking at, like I mentioned, imagine you wanting to buy coffee in Kenya and you're based in Nigeria. With the presence of AFEX in Kenya, it makes it easy for you to um, execute those transactions with coffee based on the exchange as well. So these are some of the opportunities that you see. And um, given the fact that um, the agriculture market in Africa is expected to reach a trillion dollars by 2030, it, it just helps us to fast track all this um, growth uh, as well. So AFCFTA is a game changer. FX leveraging on it is quite intuitive, quite creative. But then we think um, the benefits are just, um, we've not even scratched the surface. Yeah, well, thank God. The year is just beginning. So we have uh, at least 11 months more to scratch maybe another level of the surface. <laughs> thank you so much, Yusuf Ogubi, yeah. Head Structuring and Origination at Apex. It's now time to do an opening call to the markets. Here's Will Ebong.
Good morning. Good morning. Oh, yes, the market gets But what is expected is always a pullback in the market. The Nigeria exits reversed the gains from Monday's trading session and it recorded its first loss for 2022. And this is as investors sold off uh, stocks on Nestle, Dango Tay Cement, and Nigerian Brews was not even left out of it. The all share index now dips 0.09% to 43,859.30 points. And we see the year to date gain has now moderated to by 2.7%. We're hoping it's going higher because this is a drop from the 7% we recorded last. Last year. Now, the total volume of trades decreased by 5.4% to 294.54 million units and valued at 6.77 billion naira. It was exchanging over 4,500 deals. Now, for in terms of major contributors in the volume of trades that was traded yesterday, we saw Transco, Hill, Transco topping that chart and all at 58.36 million units, while Boa Foods was the most traded stock by value at 3.32 billion. Boa Foods has been doing so well. Stock price has been rising since it listed on the exchange last week. Now, on the sectors, we see that the consumer goods, insurance, and industrial goods declined. Now, for the consumer goods, we also we talked about Nestle starting off there. We also saw um, uh, Nigerian breweries is also the culprit there. Industrial goods counter. It was, you know, it was driven by the loss in Dangote Cement. Now, meanwhile, the second tranche of Dangote Cement share buyback program will commence next week. That's Wednesday, January the 19th. And on the flip side, we saw oil and gas and the banking index gaining there. They posted really good gains, 0.9%, um, almost 1% for the oil and gas sector. We'll move quickly to the fixed income sector. But before we do that, we see the NESD market. There was really no movement there. It just remained unchanged from the price action we saw on Monday. No people go to the fixed income market where bonds. Well, we saw a bit of it was still very, very quiet there. It opened on a bullish note yesterday. So you can see that the yields probably went down for investors. Not a very good thing, but buying instant interest was seen on the short tenor bond, especially in 2023 and 2026. And it dipped. And for the 2015, we saw a lot of uh, buy, uh, sell, sell there, I mean, buy action there. But for the Treasury bill section, it was not it was very, very quiet. Large ticket reports were done on the. Um, for this, we just went by the OMO section. We saw that there was a lot of buy action for the 13th of December 2022 paper there. And we're just wondering what investors are thinking right now, especially with the uh, inflation numbers going to be published very soon. And we're hoping that that's not going to affect too much. But we have Choma Udo to tell us what's really going on in the market. Good morning, Choma. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's good to always have you here. Now, Choma, a total of 77.61 billion uh, worth of uh, treasury bills will be matured tomorrow. Uh, that's 13th of January. While 60 billion worth of OMO bills will mature today. How does this help to manage liquidity as it appears to be a little bit tight at the moment? You're very correct. Um, liquidity is a bit tight. We have about 86 billion in the market, which is including the majority of OMO bills we had yesterday, I have about 65 billion. And today we have an um, an NCB auction, which is basically a retapping of about 77 billion across three channels, where 91 billion, and for 91 days we have 4.2 billion, 182 days we have 7.5 billion in offer, and 362 days we have 65.9 billion. This is basically where all I, uh, the last um, stop switch for that um, bill, the one year bill, of 4.9, we expect that rates are going to you know, continue that level since the NCB market is basically quiet and uh, there isn't a lot of liquidity to play around it in the market. Day, the Treasury bill will spur activities in the secondary market. Do you see it's spilling over? Do you see investors becoming more interested in buying papers, bills at the, at the secondary market? Well, for the secondary market, all the auction we have seen, action we have seen basically of the bond space, like you like, rightly said in the beginning. Um, we've seen activities at the short end of the bond curve where we've seen activities from the 2023s down to the 2026. It's been a bullish trend here. This is as a result of the maturity that we expect to come into the market and coupon payments. We have 218 billion in coupon payments and 605 billion in maturities. This will start trickling in from the third week of January. We've seen investors try to be wise, picking up um, um, assets, as you can see, the, um, now before it really trends down. So basically, most of the activities are in the bond space. We expect that the um, civil market will remain quiet. Like we said, we expect the inflation figures to trickle in. So um, that will check the cost, the cost of um, the treasury bills market. And we also expect that the results from today's auction will also give us like a leeway or headway of what to expect going forward for the treasury bills market.
Man, Choma, we are hoping that we're not going to get a low yield environment. You know, we're looking for the yields to keep going up for investors. <laughs> Thank you so much, Choma Udu, for coming on. That's Choma Udu, fixed income dealer at JT Bank. So, Ine, that's what we have for the markets, and we're hoping that the, today we'll have a bullish uh, comeback. <laughs> Equities. Yeah, we we'll certainly <laughs> always hope for the best and keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you so much, Will. So, we'll take a quick break now. When we come back, we'll do an opening call to London. Do stay with us. Welcome back. Well, we certainly have a lot to talk about uh, Brexit. Uh, thank God now I think it's good news as uh, London's powerful city financial sector is celebrated. Well, Juliana has the details. Hello, Juliana. Good morning. Good morning, Ine. So back to Brexit. And despite losing key business and bankers to rival hubs, we still see London's financial sector shining. How did you guys do this? Well, it's, it's definitely the 1%, not me, I'm afraid, um, Inny. But uh, yes, I can't determine whether or not uh, this um, article that's been released today um, is biased, possibly, um, because we know that earlier in the year, Amsterdam overtook London as being uh, the financial hub for Europe. Uh, but what's been determined by looking at the amount of um, IPOs um, that were initiated in London uh, last year worth billions of pounds, I suppose the most notable, even though it was a flop, uh, was the ride-hailing uh, food delivery service, uh, Deliveroo. It has been determined that London um, does remain the global financial centre of the world. I think really it's it's attained that position uh, for centuries, hasn't it? Not just because of the language, but because it's the centre of the world. And um, the square mile has become an ecosystem of hedge fund managers, lawyers, um, fintech workers. Uh, there are about a million people in the UK that work in the financial services sector, about 400,000 of them being um, in Britain and it, in London. And if you do take into account certain other factors, even though Amsterdam has overtaken London in Europe since Brexit, I think if you take into other factors, um, London is only second in the world uh, to New York. So, yeah, there are good things that are coming out of the square mile. Last year, at the beginning of the year, the stock market um, lost about 40% due to uh, the post-Brexit withdrawal agreement, which came into effect. Unfortunately, for some bizarre reason uh, to those working in the services industry, the financial sector uh, wasn't included. So at the moment, uh, London Financial Services cannot offer um, anybody outside of the UK access to European shares, shares. And that's a massive issue, something that they're hoping to come. But again, all news is good news when it comes to positive sentiment about the city of London. So I'm sure uh, Rishi Shunak and uh, uh, the Bank of England governor will be happy with this report this morning. I'm sure we'll certainly see their reactions uh, all over in a couple of hours uh, just when they get to their offices. Well, uh, not so good one now. The MET office has issued a yellow warning for dense fog patches that may cause travel disruption. This will certainly restrict movement and plans for the next five days. Well, yeah, um, last night, the Met Office, uh, which is uh, the weather forecaster in um, the UK, they did uh, issue a warning, um, a yellow warning, as you said, 10 p.m. Uh, for weather today. Um, it was to last up until lunchtime, but that's been removed now. Um, there was uh, concerns that travel could be disrupted because of fog density. Um, apparently, visibility was restricted to less than 100 metres, which is extremely dangerous, especially for international flights coming into the country. That's been lifted now, uh, but I suppose it just brings into fruition just how cold it is, very, very cold <laughs> in a, here in London um, at the moment. Temperatures set to dip even further, even though I'm not a weather woman. <laughs> <laughs> temperatures are going to dip even further uh, tomorrow, I believe, um, to about, in some parts of the country, minus four degrees. And if we put the business side um, into this story, it does, you know, uh, put uh, the fact that we're going into an energy crisis um, into uh, much uh, scope, because, of course, when it's cold, people need to warm their homes. And at the moment, it's very expensive to do so. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Juliana. We'll certainly get an uh, update on that and a whole lot more. And of course, uh, we're still waiting on the US. I think about lunchtime today, we'll see their figures and then mm. we'll see the reaction uh, during business and corporate. Thank you so much, Juliana. Thank you.
Let's take a peep into the crypto market now with Laddie Williams. Yeah, so we have some uh, relief for the market now. The market cap, you know, back above two trillion, and we see Bitcoin, you know, rising above the forty-two thousand level. So uh, there's some relief for traders at this point, but hopefully the bears don't, uh, you know, sell on this uh, uh, rise. Um, it's two trillion dollars now. Uh, the market cap uh, up three point one three percent. Uh, volume down fifteen percent. Uh, Bitcoin dominance there we see at a forty point one two percent. And we see uh, Bitcoin uh, able to rise above the 42,000 level this morning at $42,700. It's up by 1.40%. Uh, 24-hour volume at $25.42 billion. And we see Ethereum, too, not looking bad. Also been able to stay above the $3,000 mark at $3,200, up 4% this morning. A bigger rise than Bitcoin there. 24-hour uh, volume traded in Ethereum, 15.16. A billion dollars. So uh, the bulls are looking uh, quite strong this morning, uh, but who knows what's going to happen next. Uh, BNB, $461. It's up uh, 5%. Looking at the top ultimate market cap, uh, the, uh, the token for the crypto exchange there having a recovery. So it's uh, a mostly a broad recovery around the market this morning. Cardano, $1.21, up 5%. 5, uh, 5%. Solana, $139. But CXRP there, uh, still below the 80 uh, 80 uh, cents uh, mark. Uh, let's bring in uh, Gilbert, your partner now, a digital market analyst. Great to have you, Gilbert. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Ladi. Yeah, so uh, how are you seeing this uh, 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 jump, this spike in uh, uh, price of Bitcoin? You, we did get to about $39,000, then got a sharp rise there. How are you seeing the market? Okay, the market is still resting its uh, key zones. And uh, it's good to still see that there was a high rejection at the 39K zone. And uh, we have uh, an increase and a possible bounce beyond the present price we are in. We may probably go test the 46, 47K zone as well. All right. Um, you know, we've seen major markets, you know, rattled by, you know, it, the, 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 the talk about interest rates, uh, hikes. But how does it really affect uh, Bitcoin? You know, thinking that Bitcoin should actually, you know, be a hedge you know, at some point. Okay, central bank excessive printing actually uh, bring in a high demand on the use of Bitcoin as a hedge, uh, which is also regarded as digital uh, gold and a safe haven asset. Uh, Bitcoin came into existence at the time when interest rates were low. So a quick increase in uh, interest rates can bring about a short-term speculatory uh, downward movement. But uh, we must remember that Bitcoin is an open-source monetary system that anyone can trust. So we have trust now for this monetary system, but it will just be a matter of time before the consequence of increased interest rates will step in, and also they will discover they just can't fight inflation and a weak economy together. The, the crypto market is a global ecosystem, and the U.S. will need to get themselves together, or else they may end up in a disadvantaged position. Yeah, but it seems like the crypto market is, you know, losing that uh, hedge quality about it, because... I noticed that when you see sell-offs in major uh, markets, you also see sell-offs in the crypto market. So uh, like a recent IMF report I saw says it's not looking good as a hedge. Okay, this is because the market is controlled by people and investors. So if investors panic, because many people still regard Bitcoin not just as a safe haven, they use it for speculatory reasons. Maybe this may be because it may not have a thousand years of, uh, of uh, store value purpose, but as time goes on, people will discover that it is an open source monetary system with a limited supply, which even makes it a better store of value. So it's just a matter of time once people discover that you just can't use this for speculatory purpose, but as a store of as a store of value, we will see it always outperform any other asset class that it is being uh, pegged to. Well, quite interesting. It did uh, outperform uh, gold, though. Anyway, uh, Gilbert, thank you so much. All right, thank you. It's All right, you. top five gainers there. We see uh, Phantom there, two dollars eighty cents, up eighteen point five zero percent. That at uh, the Dagger blockchain infrastructure. Looking good this morning. Uh, we see Harmony there. Harmony has been on a rise 
uh, recently. It's at the 31 cents, up 13 percent this morning. And we see Kusama there, 273 dollars, uh, up 10 percent. Uh, top losers there. We see Dash there. Dash was uh, beginning to rise, but uh, lost it. It's uh, rise, the rising trend at this point. It's down 7 percent. And uh, ICP, the internet computer, having a pullback also down 4%. And we see uh, Chainlink, yeah, one of the favorites there, is down 4%. And we see a couple of stable coins. Uh, so it needs uh, some relief in the market right now. Some relief, uh, but I mean, I, I, I found that uh, conversation about uh, crypto being a hedge and not being a hedge very interesting. Yeah. Because with the volatility in the market, I don't know how you can make it a hedge. You exactly. Know? But, you know, <laughs> some argue that, okay, look at gold, which is a safe haven in about 10 years. It's actually gone down. Mm. So they're saying, oh, Bitcoin has gone up about over 100% in uh, just uh, last year. So that's where they're looking at it from, you know, so... <laughs> Yeah, it, anyway, they, they, the I think debate it's just, goes on. <laughs> it's just important that investors get a lot of information exactly. before they make a decision. Yeah. Really What's important. your best hedge? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Ladi. Well, that's it on the program. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Do remember to join us at 1.30 p.m. Business and Corporate will bring you an update from the world of business. But we'll do this again tomorrow at 10 a.m. I'm Ini John Mekwa.